Oh my goodness, so we're on the same team. Let's see. Okay, well, I'm gonna do what I always gonna do. Ooh, Reef Blast Body. What is happening in here? I'm trying to look at the map. Oh, getting dissified. Okay, it's mine. Ooh, they all swarming over there. See, I can't see nothing. There you go. There you go. There you go, friend. There you go, crispy. Crispy bacon. Stop. See, I'm I'm like really bad playing bad ever since ever since a couple of days. Is there somebody coming behind me? I don't need to look at my map. Man, I'm tripping. So what's happening? Rocket rider, ride my rocket. Mm. You know you want to. So I, I've just, you know, I've had something happen, and I, I think it's part of the growth process, you know. But uh, I feel very strange. I need to get in my robot mode. Come on, you die. Okay. There you go. Come on, friend. There you go. Oh, no. And now I'm in the red. Oh, I'm going to die. <clears throat> It's not going to go back there, Reef Blast Body, you bot. All right. You got the, uh, yeah, you turn it up. You got, once you got the disc, disc launch thing of things. Oh, man. And I, I'm just, yeah, I'm tripping. I got to That's a little bit better. It's sort of, it's sort of like music. Okay. Ooh, ain't none of y'all. You got your thing, and now you're gone. That's what's going on. He he wanted to get the thing on two levels, and now he left. Phoenix Rising. Can I detect any any humanitizations of you? It's 
say enough. See, I try to back up. I did back up. Hey. Can I get some heals over here? You bots. It feels worse not to get heals from bots, because bots ought to know better. If they had a dang heal bot, they had a heal. Nice gardener. So yesterday, yeah, you know, I had been uh, reading the, the history of the Jews in six volumes of Heinrich Gretz. And um, yeah, he, he made some frank, frank statements about, you know, all the stuff about angels and Judaism being originally from Persia. Then all that stuff came from Persia. And uh, in this world, you know, it's like really hard to get time into study. You know, but um, yeah, people need to know that. You know, uh, it's, it's, that's significant. A lot of people are so fixated on that. It's like Islam, sort of. You know, really big on the angels of Gabriel. I guess the angel Gabriel. Son of Bart. Okay, I'm fully charged. See, I worry about the thing I worry about. Yeah, you know, if it's a bot, ultimately, it, it can, it's just letting you live, you know, it could, it could be programmed to, to not let you live. <laughs> Suck a Joey out. And then you would die every time. You 
could not win. Come on, Roundhouse. Don't you know I'm loving you? Oh, no. Please stay your behind back over here. Oh, now you you getting change your mind? Get your pulse cannon breath off of me. Man, you up here in my crib and all. I don't want that. Carnivore for you. Suck it away. Suck it away. I reflect back on, you know, it's like, <clears throat> I guess what I'm going through, you know, realizing, well, uh, you know, and I'll repeat it again. I got I was on Reddit and I got the list of all the bots. There's something like 432 or something known bots. And you know, then it dawned on me, it's like most of the time you're playing bots. Usually when somebody invites you one to one, it's somebody that's trying to get coin or something like that. That they're trying to they 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 see your some kind of division you know they go in your hangar and they go well you you can't withstand anything that i have and so therefore i want to challenge you and that way i can automatically win so you see a lot of that and that's not very interesting <laughs> it's sort of boring i don't know maybe it's it's more of a challenge well i mean it's even in the realm of possibility that that that's what's going through my mind um but it fascinates me that, uh, you know, really seeing a list of all the bots and going, yeah, these are all 100% bots. Something changed in, in my mind, you know. Um, you know, like, for, here, here, here's, here's an example. Uh, the dancing around a control point when you're capturing it, like going back and forth. <laughs> I'm thinking that's a person doing that. I would be like, what is this, a fashion? Well, that's some bot stuff right there. That's very dumb. Because as I said, you know, when somebody, if somebody's gonna go in a circle around a control point, you just lay your sight right on one side of the circle and wait for them to walk around. And they're gonna walk around it three times. And on the second and third shot, they're going to be nothing on us. Now I'm saying to myself, it's a bot. That's why it's so stupid. And noticing the lack of coordination and cooperation. Lack of live communication. This is bad. Ooh, they all in our behind. 
King Nigel and stuff. Will you go for that control point or are you just gonna stand there all day? I'm just gonna stand there all day. Oh no. Shoot my own people. No, I should have hit him. That's an annoyance. Oh no. Good, glad to have you back, King Nigel. You're an old buddy. But, you know, I saw somebody like, oh, it's supposed, I spent all this money, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be player versus player, and there's all these bots, and I want to have a class action suit. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, why is it, I guess it's different because you thought there was people behind them. Oh no. How you all the way over here? Oh, you got killed back there, that's why. Um And there's not people behind. But people are dumb too. <laughs> I saw your tire rolling by hallucinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess the really good serious players well you know they're out there when I, when I, I, I haven't watched a lot of other people's combat videos because I just don't have time um good Let's leave this team and see if I can find uh, Chef Lajos. I'll wait till he gets to his hangar. Yeah, and this might be a good time for me to just kind of chill here, here for a minute and talk about um, my reaction. I, I guess, in a sense, as a new gamer, I've never, you know, I've never really tried to get good at, at games. And my daughter, I was working two years in elementary school, and, and my daughter was home by herself, and her mom was sort of. You know, she, her, her mom is also a game, you know, a gamer type too. She um, had been at home, kind of in a cloistered life in the Philippines most of her life, and um, you know, it's clear that she's got very high-end gaming skills, right? And I had worked in game development, and so my my wife during the two years that I was at the uh, elementary school. You know, she was involved in her stuff during the day, 
watching her TikTok videos or whatever and stuff like that. And, and our daughter was kind of on her own. And she got seriously into the gaming, very much into the gaming. So I was like, man, I need to get into it too. Because if I want to get her, I don't want to make her learning a verse. You know, I, I want, you know, I don't want to, you know, my, my wife is like, well, let's limit her gaming time and let's punish her if she doesn't uh, uh, obey and all this stuff like that. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, she's free. Let her, let her uh, uh, taste that, that freedom, you know, and do what she wants to do, experience what she wants to experience. Let me send him a little message in case I trip out. Because I'm on an attention deficit and not look at it for a while, but but anyway, so I got into this this gaming thing, and what happened is, uh, um, uh, I took an interest in the Plarium. It's an Israeli company from Herz Herzliya, and you know you want to support the people, uh, and th they hire a lot of, of people in Poland and Ukraine and stuff like that. I have emotional strains. Uh, tied up with Eastern Europe because of my life and background. Um, so, so I got in and I, well, I mean, you know, when you play, like when we're playing Doom and the monsters are coming after you in Doom or you're playing Diablo and the, the monsters are coming after you in Di Diablo, Maybe it was kind of different somehow. I, I, you know, no, I don't know. Well, it was clear that you can master it. You can master the game. You know, like it's like playing Space Invaders. You know, you could get better and better at it, and you could you could master it. But I guess what's sort of different now is that the bots are apparently very dynamic. that as you level up, your opponents also level up. Well, I guess they did that on Galaga as well. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with the, the response to that uh, of yeah, realizing yeah, it's 400 or something. Cause yeah, I saw a lot of, a lot of people out there and This is something I want to do here. So we got 172 divided by 306.562. And what I need here. One thousand one hundred sixty-one over seventeen years. Point six six four.
I'm gonna start keeping a list point. Six ninety eight over twelve thirty four. So here's a guy, Chef Lajos, he's got point six six four, right? But I just picked three others. One, two, three, and they were all equal to the nearest hundredths of a percentage point.
Let me get another one. Let's look at Terminator. 759 over 1011. No. I love it. 0.75. That's a real person. And he's got a 0.75. Okay, I like that. Okay, well, Vlahos is not coming on, so. It's not going to hurt me to practice. It's really not. I don't know if, if you if you get where I'm going with the numbers. My my concern is um, if they're bots and they're bots on your team or whatever. It, it's like it, it could the cars could be stacked. <clears throat> For the house to win, that's the ideal, right? designing of games but this is also part of uh, me starting to play games you know uh, and figuring out what that's about all right look you know I, I should I should go back here Number one is Grimy Maniac. Let's look at Grimy Maniacs. Ooh. I, I'm going to check out Grimy Maniacs. Uh, what is this? 22,647. If it's 80%, I'm going to feel a little bit weird. Divided by 2646. 11 thirteenths or yeah let's see he's got an 86 number one is 86 so the house is still 15 percent win. check that one more time it's uh what in the world did i close it wasn't it 0.855 okay i'm a fool number one
kill five mechs while you have less than 10% hit points remaining. I did it. I forget what a hunter award is. Scrap five implants. Let me see if I can go do that. Uh, inventory. Pilots. Implant index. Oh, I can. Installed, installed, installed. All these are installed. So, what have I got in the way of free? Let's see. Pick that up. Okay. Some Panther Blueprints, 24 coins. Pulse Cannon, 8. These I definitely want. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. I've, I've got a... take a while all right so I, I yeah that, I, I got that all right so day three let's see all right, kill five mechs from behind with support mechs. Oh. Become MVP with two mechs in one battle. All right, so this will be a good chance for me to go in with support mechs. Just go in. Zephyr, MD, and then Ares. So that's going to be the sequence until I, I break that series of objectives. Zephyr. Okay, I'll go. Eva, you're a bot. any more support max? No, I might as well come out with the air raids now.
<laughs> Eva. <clears throat> Shotgun girl. Rock girl. How do I view the sponsored videos? I don't know how to do that. That's that old, well, no. No, I literally thought. Oh. was a long arm standing over there. Mm -hmm.
coffee. Mmm. Tell you right now. Yep. Get my support max. Bombay Thunder. No thanks to me. Can you like bite yourself over to Botland and do some robotics? I guess a pulse cannon, 28,000. Yeah, not much chance.
real toe hours. Cover me.
Hmm. Ronaldo. Missile rack, 100,000 damage. I could withstand that. In my dreams. Ronaldo with a hundred thousand damage missile rack.
Where's my mind? Okay, well, I'm going through some things. That's true. I wonder, is it... I don't know if that crackle comes across, but it's like some kind of cell phone thing, I think. Put my cell phone down, and it went away. But I, I don't know. Maybe it's caused by that. Maybe it's not. Got four deathmatch tickets. I guess I'll just practice with this MD. Javelin rack four and Javelin rack eight. Giga, Giga Dramon, Giga Draman. Frustrating. Eleven thousand, hundred thousand all together. That's cool.
Yeah, new truth with the javelin rack six and the javelin rack eight for a hundred thousand damage. Yeah, he's gonna dominate. Logical. I'm get my implants. Shop. Spawn mechs paired with epic pilots. Now, let, let's see. I don't even know who the epic pilots are. Legendary. Rare. Epic. Okay, so Nova's an epic pilot. That means I think Rosa is an epic. Epic Pilot Rosa. Okay, so Pilot Daily. Let's go. Do a quick match. Spawn Rosa a couple of times to see if that clears out objectives. Trying to play along with you guys. Two sponsored videos. How do I watch the sponsored video? I attention deficit that every time. This America? Now for what? I would like to take you out, but I didn't, didn't get you. down for what? I need to meet with you. Where be?
Heartbreaking. away from you.
Are you kidding me? I thought I just spawned uh, Rosa like three times. I don't know. You wonder if that's a fair spin, you know, I really do. I'm going to the zone. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run my, my book. For a short time, the flourishing seaport because of their trade with the Ladat were included in the accusation of Udazi and imprisoned, and their goods confiscated as a matter of course. The furious Pope thus cut off a considerable source of his revenue at the moment when he was about to plunge into a costly war with Spain. 569, but very few Miranda succeeded in escaping from the bailiffs of the Inquisition. They were all received by Duke Guido of Alto, of Urbino, and quartered in Pesaro because he was then at the with the Pope and about to transfer the trade of the Ladat from Ancona to Pesaro by means of the connection of the Mirandos with Turkey. Duke Hercules II of Ferrara also offered the Portuguese and Spanish Jews from whatever country they might have fled and asylum in his dominions, and formally invited them in December 1555. Among those who escaped to Pesar was a man then held in high repute, the celebrated physician Amadeus Shabu Lucid of 1511, died 1568, a sensible and intelligent man, a skillful physician, a noted scholar, and a man of equal conscientiousness and amiability. As a pretended Christian, he had borne the name of Joe Rodrigo de Queso Franco. He appears to have been driven from his home by the introduction of the Inquisition into Portugal. He had been for some time in Antwerp, then the most important city of Flanders, afterwards visited both Ferrara and Rome, but had permanently established himself at Ancona about 1549, where he had openly assumed his family name of Chabot, and Latinized it under the form of Amadeus Lucidimus. Although he was himself a Jew, he was frequently in service with the most known to attend him in sickness. Suffers came to him from far and near. The art of healing was to him a sacred office, which he fulfilled with his whole soul in the endeavor to prolong human life. Amadeus was able to take a solemn oath by God and his holy commandments, had he had always labored purely for the welfare of mankind, had never concerned himself about compensation, had never accepted valuable presents, had treated the poor without peace, and made no difference between Jews and Christians and Turks. Nothing ever hindered him five seven years of his devoted calling, neither family considerations, nor long distances. Amadeus had many disciples of his art who were attached to him, and whom he regarded as his children. In his young days, he had written medical works so highly esteemed that they were often printed during his lifetime. The greatest interest was excited by a seven centuries each dealing with a hundred cases of illness, in which he manipulated the strength of his remedies and their effect, and gave the characteristics of his patients. These cures procured for him very extensive fame during his lifetime. They were frequently printed in Italy, France, Germany, and even in Spain, and were used by other physicians as textbooks. Amadeus received an invitation from the King of Poland to come to his court in the capacity of his private physician, an invitation which he did not accept. This benefactor of mankind, the ornament of his time, was obliged to flee like a criminal from Ancona to Pesaro, and afterwards to journey even further, because he refused to make a ridiculous confession of faith before the bloodthirsty Inquisition of Alfort, and did not wish to expose himself to the risk of death at the stake. More than a hundred Portuguese Mirandos, unable to flee, had to pine in the dungeons of the Inquisition until their sentence was announced to them. This was to the effect that those who penitently made confession of the Catholic faith should be set at liberty, but be carried to the island of Malta, and it all honor and dignity. Fifteen men of the of the and twenty four of them, among them an aged woman, Donna Amira, remained firm in the faith of their fathers, the Lord our God is one God, and were burned at the state May, 1556. Most of those to be transported to Malta and Spain, and took refuge in Turkey. 
by a border culture, but all Jews read the news of this shocking 571 catastrophe was spread abroad. The sentence was that illegal as cruel, because, as has already been said, the religious freedom of Miranda's and Ancona had been solemnly confirmed by three persons. The forces of Miranda's in Turkey were completely stunned by this lower minister in their fellow government. They were trying to sell to the means by which to be revenged on the insanely cruel Pope. The peculiar position of the Jews in this century made it possible for them to entertain the idea of a struggle with their malicious enemy in the chair of St. Peter. The union of all the Jews of the East might furnish the means. There lived at this time a noble Jewish lady, an ornament to her sex and her people by her grace, her intelligence, her character, and greatness of mind. One of those beings whom Providence seems to praise in the world from time to time that the likeness of man to the divine image may not be quite forgotten. Donna Gacha Mendeja was an English for Jewish contemporaries pronounced only with admiration and love. Less without all means, but she expended wisely, and only for the benefit of others and for the elevation of mankind. She commanded an influence equal to that of a princess, and reigned over the willing hearts of hundreds of thousands. She was called the Esther of her time. But with anguish of mind she was obliged to endure before she dared openly to call herself Gacha Hannah. The waves of meanness and wickedness surged around her, but could not sully the purity of her soul. Born in Portugal about 1510, died about 1568, of the Moronic family named Benvenisti, she was married under the Christian name of Beatrice to a rich participator in the same unhappy fate, one of the house of Nassi, who had taken the baptismal name of Francisco Mendes. He had founded an extensive banking business, branches of which extended through Flanders and 572 France. The German emperor and ruler of two continents, Charles V, the king of France, and many princes besides, were debtors to the house of Mendes. A younger brother, Diogo Mendes, was head of the branch bank of Antwerp. When the husband of Beatrice died before 1525, leaving her with one daughter named Reina, and the terrible Inquisition, introduced into Portugal, threatened danger to her property and the lives of herself and her child, she betook herself to her brother-in-law at Antwerp, accompanied by a younger sister and several young nephews. She furnished poor Miranda's with the means to flee from the fires of the Inquisition. The sons which sued a Christian state to the emissaries and creatures of the Pope to frustrate the Inquisition, went through her hands and her brother-in-law's. The Mendes family acquired a high position in Antwerp, where there were many Miranda's. Mendes's young, handsome and clever nephew, Joe Mies, associated with the first people in the city, and was much beloved by Maria, ruler of the Netherlands, formerly Queen of Hungary, sister to Charles V. Beatrice was by no means at ease in Antwerp. Affection for the religion in which she had been born, and which she was compelled to deny, and horror of the Catholic faith forced upon her, made Flanders just as hateful to her as Portugal. She longed for a country where she could freely follow the impulses of her heart, glowing with love to Judaism. She, therefore, imprisoned her brother-in-law, the head of the banking business, who had married her sister, either to go to Germany, or elsewhere, with her, or pay over her share of the property. Diogo Mendes gives her time for this removal, but died before the line 15 to 15 for this. This was the beginning of sorrowful days for Mendesia. She was recognized by her brother-in-law's will as the head of 573, the widely extended business, but could not settle the affairs of the house quickly enough to enable her to follow the wish of her heart, and betake herself to some tolerant land, where she could openly confess herself a Jewess. Besides, Charles V, in his covetousness, cast an eye upon the large property of the house of Mendes. An accusation was made by the Imperial Attorney General after the deceased Diogo Mendes had secretly practiced Judaism. It may also have become known that he had supported the antagonists of the Inquisition by word and deed. It was, therefore, decreed that the whole of his property, being that of a heretic, should be forfeited to the exchequer. The order was issued that the goods and account books of the House of Mendesia be seized and sealed. But the widow Mendesia succeeded in satisfying the avarice of the officials for the moment by bribes and the advance of a large loan. But it was impossible for her to leave Edward without exciting suspicion against herself and endangering her property still more. Thus she was obliged to remain there in great distress of mind for more than two years, until the loan was repaid by the Emperor. At length the hour of deliverance seemed to be at hand, when she might leave Edward, and proceed to Venice. A story circulated that her nephew, Joe Meese, had fled to Venice with her daughter Rena, for whose hand several Christian noblemen sued. Perhaps this was a story sedulously spread by the Mendes family so as to afford a pretext for their journey to Venice, and that no hindrance might be interposed. But this precaution was not successful. After her departure, Charles V again gave orders that her property, so far as it lay within his dominions, should be seized, because the sisters were secret Jewesses, and Mendesia the elder, as she was called, was compelled to pay large sums to avert this fresh calamity. By setting forth of misfortune, greater than any that she had yet experienced, was in store for her at Venice, from a quarter when she least expected it, namely, from her younger sister, the latter, as reckless and scattered arranged as the elder was prudent and sedate, demanded her share of the property and her daughters, to do with as she pleased. But Donna Mendesia neither could nor would agree to this, she having been made sole manager of the property, and also guardian of her niece, still under age. Chaining at this guardianship, and probably guided by evil counselors, the younger sister took a step which turned out to her own disadvantage. She informed the Venetian government that her sister was about to emigrate to Turkey, and take for all her wealth, there to resume her adherence to Judaism, while she herself and her daughter desired to remain Christians. And she asked the Venetian authorities to assist her in obtaining possession of her property, in order that she might use it as a good Christian in Venice. The rulers of Venice, seeing the prospect of a rich prize, did not hesitate to take up the accusation, cited the accused to appear before the legal authorities, and arrested her to prevent her flight. Her ill advised and worthless sister also sent an avaricious, Jew hating messenger to France to take possession of the property there belonging to the Mendes family. This envoy, thinking himself insufficiently paid for his errand, denounced the younger sister also as a secret Jewess, and the French court confiscated the Mendes property in France. King Henry II also held himself exempt from repaying his debt to the family. The unfortunate Mendesia was meantime endeavoring to divert these blows aimed at herself and her property. Her nephew, Joe Meese, gave the rural assistance to prevent losses and to set his noble brother free. Either he or his aunt found a way to induce Sultan Solomon to embrace their 575 cause. Such immense riches were about to be brought into his dominions, and the Venetian Republic, which insisted only by its forbearance, dared to fight him of them. That roused his fury. His private physician, Moses Hanley, a Jew who hoped to win the hand of the rich heiress Reina for his son, had disposed the Sultan in favor of the Mendes family. A special messenger of state TSHAUS was sent by the court to Venice, with instructions that the imprisoned Morano was at once to be set free and allowed to depart unhindered for Turkey with all her property. 
In consequence of this, the difference arose between the court of Turkey and the Republic of Venice, which afterwards led to animosities. An important part was thus thrust upon this poor lady against her will. In the meantime, she succeeded her one knows how more finding a place of refuge in Ferrara under the protection of the liberal minded Duke of Philippe of Est, where she resided for several years, about 1549 to 1553, under her Jewish name, a blessing and the comfort of her fellow sufferers for their faith. Here she was able for the first time to exercise openly and freely her sublime virtue, her lively sympathies, her generosity, her genuine piety and neighborly, all the noble never heard. Her wisdom and prudence were of great service to the Mirandos in Italy. The poet Samuel Rust, who dedicated his beautiful work to her, spoke of her with enthusiasm and deep respect. He makes his new will, who plays the part of consular in the dialogues, utter among other grounds of consolation for the sufferings of the Israelites, that they had met with unexpected help from this good woman, who has not seen divine mercy reveal itself in human form, as it has shown, and still shows itself to be a shield and defense against thy wretchedness, who has not seen the heartfelt compassion of Miriam over again in the sacrifice of her own life to save that of her brethren, or the great wisdom of Deborah in ruling her fellow men, or the infinite virtue and holiness of Esther in protecting the defenseless, 576 or the number of the exertions of the chaste widow Judith in order to deliver the besieged from terror. The Lord hath sent her down nowadays from the midst of his holy angels, and united every virtue in one person, and for thy happiness it is that he hath placed this soul in the lovely form of the blessed Jewish Nazi. She was who, at the beginning of the dispersion of the Mirandos, gave strength and hope to thy passion sons, made hopeless by their want of means to escape the fire, and encouraged them to go forth on their pilgrimage. With bountiful hand did she succor those who had already set out on their wandering in Flanders and other parts, and who, weakened by poverty and overcome by the perils of the sea passage, were in danger of getting no further, and strengthened them in their need. She did not withhold her favor even from her enemies. With her pure hand and her heavenly love, she freed most of this nation of Miranda's from the depths of endless misery, poverty, and sin, led them into safe places, and gathered them together into obedience to the precepts of the true God. Thus did she become thy strength and thy weakness. The two editors of the Ferrara Spanish Bible, Abrahamus and Appius, who dedicated it to her highness the Sinner of John Roger, described her invaluable services in a few words. We desire to dedicate the translation to your grace, as the person whose deserts among our people will always occupy the foremost place. May you be pleased to accept it, to favor and protect it with the spirit which has always favored those who have asked help of you. As she protected all three of the us, this new deed is now worship under this. But all, even the most conscientious rabbi of the time, were full of her praise, and wrote with equal enthusiasm, if not elegance, of her virtues. The noble princess, the glory of Israel, the wise woman who builds her house in holiness and beauty, with her hands sustains the poor and needy, in order to make them happy in this world, and bless in the world to come. Men are the whom she has rescued from death, and lifted up from the abasement of a worthless life, when they were languishing in a dungeon, and were given over to death. She hath founded houses wherein all may learn the law of God. She has given to many the means whereby they may not only live, but live in plenty. After Donna Gracia Nasty had become reconciled to her sister, who publicly saw that she endangered herself by assuming an antagonistic attitude towards 577 Gracia, after she had seen her sister's child, the beautiful young Gracia, betrothed to her nephew Samuel Nasty and Ferrara, and after she had provided like a mother for all the members of her family, she carried out her long cherished intention, and betook herself to the Turkish capital to escape the many annoyances to which she was subject in Christian territory. Her gifted nephew, Joe Mies, who was betrothed to her daughter Rena, and who had undertaken long journeys to Lyons, Marseille, Rome, and Sicily on business affairs, and by his adroitness prepared a good reception for her in Constantinople. With skillful diplomacy, acquired by intercourse with Christian statesmen, he obtained a hearty recommendation to Constantinople from M. de Lanzac, the ambassador at the French court, with whom the main Desnassi family had been at enmity, and so met with a favorable reception there. In Constantinople, Joe Meeks made open avowal of Judaism, assuming the name of Joseph Nassi, and marrying his wealthy cousin Rena. He did not go thither alone, but took with him a great following of 500 persons, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian Jews. He made his appearance there as a prince. His tact, his knowledge of European affairs, and his wealth, procured him an entrance into the court circle, and secured the favor of Solomon. But his noble mother in law remained the principal manager of the large property of the family. The Jewish inhabitants of Constantinople soon felt the beneficent hand of Donna Gracia and her son in law. They assisted the poor, established houses of prayer and schools, and made endowments for teachers of the Talmud. But their benevolence was not limited to standards and fortunes, it extended to Germany and beyond the city of Constantinople. When the news came that Pope Paul IV had imprisoned the Mirandos of Antonio with the intention 578 of burning them sooner or later, the heart of Donna Gracia felt a terrible pain, as a mother when her children are in misfortune, for she had taken them all into her heart as her son and brothers. She did not give herself up to useless limitation, but at once joined with her son in law in taking active steps for their relief. She first addressed herself to Sultan Solomon, entreating him to demand that at least Marana Jews from Turkey, in Ancona on business, be surrendered to him, and have the happiness of seeing this request fulfilled. Sultan Solomon addressed a letter to the Pope March 9, 1556, in the haughty tone which Turkish rulers, in the consciousness of their power, assumed towards the Christian princes, weakened by disunion. He complained that his Jewish subjects had been unjustly imprisoned, whereby his treasury had suffered the loss of fully 4,000 ducats, besides a still greater diminution of revenues on account of injuries to Turkish Jews. The Sultan insisted that the Pope should at once set at liberty all Turkish Mirandos in Ancona, and hinted that, in case his representation meet with an unfavorable reception, reprisals would be made upon Christian's rebellion as enemies. Paul IV was most unwillingly compelled to submit, set free the Turkish Jews, and allow them to depart uninjured. The remainder, who had no powerful partisan, were, as has been said, burned. The Jews resolved to be revenged on the Pope, and Pope for the act of aid of Donna Gracia and her son-in-law in accomplishing this purpose. Duke Guido Aldo, of Urbino, had received the Mirandos from Ancona in his sorrow, only because he thought by this means to bring the love and trade of the Jews to his own court. The community of Pesaro, therefore, sent a dispatch to all the Turkish communities which had commercial relations with Italy, requesting that they no longer send their 579 goods to Ancona, but to Pesaro. The commerce of the Turkish Jews was very considerable. Everything passed through their hands, they competed with the Venetians, and sent out their own ships and galleys. The Jewish Levantine merchants had hitherto made Ancona the staple port for the wares shipped from Turkey to Europe, in order to lessen the preeminence of Venice. 
In the first second of indignation after shameful deed of good fall forth, many of the left tenants agreed to the proposed leveraging of the Kinsara of Elegance, 1556, and resolved to punish him severely by entirely cutting off the important source of revenue arising from the commerce of the land. But as this measure was practical only, it all his trading with the labor of to it. The participators in the arrangements at first only agreed not to carry on trade with Elegance for eight months till March, 1557. The Jews of Kinsara and the Moran was formerly in the Turkish dominions, of course, made every effort to effect a general movement to place the Pope at his seat for under death. But the resident Jews of Ancona, not Miranda's, were afraid that their interests would suffer injury by the removal of the trade of the land to pay sorrow, and they lost no time in sending letters to the Jewish communities in Turkey, entreating them not to make any binding agreement, because they would incur great danger, owing to the passionate disposition of the Pope, who would certainly drive them into misery if he learned that the Jews intended to be revenged by him. All I were, therefore, directed towards Constantinople, for they are the representatives of the commercial towns of Salonika, Adrianople, Rusa, Ancona, and the Moria had sent letters requesting that the matter be well laid, and their interests regarded. Donna Gosha and Joseph Nassi, of course, had the principal voice, and they were resolved by the from the beginning to punish the inhuman Pope severely. They had instructed their agents to send the goods belonging to their house to pay sorrow. The Portuguese and some of the Spanish communities in Turkey agreed to make a decided stand and prohibit trade with Ancona under threat of exclusion from Jewish commercial circles. But some opposition was made in Constantinople itself, many of the merchants fearing that their interests would be endangered by the preference given to pay sorrow. The matter was, therefore, in the hands of the rabbis of Constantinople. If they unanimously considered that the port of Ancona was to be avoided out of regard for the danger which threatened the Mirandos of pay sorrow, their authority would fall into the balance and settle the question. Gracha and Joseph, therefore, influenced the rabbis so that they decided to pronounce against the Pope. Two rabbis, however, were opposed to this decision. As no unanimous decision was made in the chief community of Constantinople, the Jewish merchants of the other Turkish communities were spared the imposition of restrictions upon their trade with Ancona. In the main Don and Raja, who regarded the question as of the deepest interest, demanded an opinion from the rabbis of the community of Sabbath, which enjoyed the highest authority among the Jews of the East, in the persons of its two representatives, Joseph Carl and Moses D. Trani. The band of the rabbis against Pope Paul IV was not put into action. Whilst the rabbis were still consulting, that which Don and Raja and her adherents had been fearing to the great brain came to pass. Duke Leo Aldo, disappointed in his expectation of seeing his court of Pesaro become the center of the Jewish Levitine commerce, and attacked by the Pope for his favor towards Jews, ordered the Morandos to depart from Pesaro March, 1558. It must be accounted a great merit in him that he did not surrender by the one them to the officers of the Inquisition. Most of the exiles sailed eastward and hired ships. But the Pope's naval police lay in wait for them, and they escaped with difficulty. Some were taken prisoners, and treated as slaves. The skillful and humane physician, Andres Lucidus, a Morano, who had resided for a short time in Pesaro, and then in Ragusa, restoring many Christians to life and health, was also obliged to quit Christian territory and take refuge in the town of Salonika, almost entirely peopled by Jews 1558 to 1559. The same year seems to have brought misfortune also to the Morandos of Ferrara, and the Duke withdrew his protection from them, for the printing press of Abraham was closed, and Joseph Nassi's brother, Don Samuel Nassi, was so badly treated by the Duke, that he was obliged to call in the intercession of the Turkish court to enable him to remove to Constantinople in peace. One threatening glance from the infidel Sultan had more effect upon Christian princes than the voice of justice and humanity. The nearer Paul Philip approached the grave, the more did he become incensed against the Jews. Two baptized Jews, named Sixtus and Sis, and Philip or Joseph Moro, as his command traveled through the Jewish community situated in the papal states and annoyed the Jews with their seditious sermons. The latter once forced his way into the synagogue at Reaping on the day of atonement 1558, with a crucifix, which the Jews regarded as an idolatrous image, and with violence placed it in the ark where the sacred world was kept. When the Jews turned him out for this insult to their sanctuary, he collected a furious mob round the house of God, and two Jews who had laid hands on him were seized and scourged by order of the chief magistrate. Pope Paul IV was most enraged against the Morandos at atonement. He tried to drive the former out of their most secret hiding places by leading too many pseudo Christians of Saint Portugal. So to speak, how could the wolves to escape being attacked by them? Paul IV, to whom complaints were made that Jewish Christians had joined the Orders of Christ, forbade them to receive Jews as members. He went yet more thoroughly to work with this time, of which not a copy of the people speaks with throughout the greater part of the world, nor is there being exposed to the heaviest penalty. The schools, for the most part, were closed. Had this condition of things become universal, great ignorance and starvation would have spread among Italian Jews, and facilitated the great project of the Pope and conversion.
positively in the East, and Canadian efforts punished by the for a larger but more to cast suspicion upon the management of the issue. The baptized friends of Elias Lolita, the Venice canon Vittorio Eliano, had charged this ceremony's owner, and he did not hesitate to write a post of either premise to attract buyers, and to have his own name mentioned in connection with it. Whilst it was being printed, the Spanish soldiers were searching for Jewish writing in Cremona, and found 2,000 copies of his work, in which they were trying to pass into the money from it. Vittorio Eliano and his partners very nearly lost their property in their promise, but another convert, the one named Sixth Cosina, pushed out a paper inquisition to help him destroy the town in Cremona, restrain the fury of the Spanish soldiers, and rescue the Zeller. Thus the town was burnt, and the Zeller spared for the time being. It was a wise scene of the enemies of the Jews which led them to spare the city of spring in the hope that the parents of Zeller would assume the now students. It's very broad by the press, the Zeller came to be considered a non book, and for some time was as much quoted as verses from the Bible, and treated on an equality with the holy scriptures and all Hebrew works not strictly town beautiful. But the love of the papers for the catalog did not last long. A few years later, the catalog was invited to remove the new catalog of books to be burnt in the conservatories. All I need to do is that their writing was not to do, but nourished by the fanatical spirit.
precepts we were conjured issued by my highly venerated predecessor, out of the zeal for religion, and as we are told, sir, some who covered your goods as a pretext for false accusations against you, and have been interpreted contrary to the intentions of my predecessor, thus causing you to be vexed and disquieted. Therefore, we decree, in consideration that Holy Mother Church grants and concedes much to Jews in order that the remnant of them may be saved, and in accordance with the example of our predecessors, etc. All that the new Pope conceded, however, was that Jews of the Roman dominions beyond the city be allowed to dot their distinguishing mark, the yellow cap, acquire land to the value of 1,500 ducats, trade and other things besides old clothes, and hold intercourse with Christians, but not to keep Christian servants. This was about all that one of the best Pope's granted, or dared grant. More important to the Jews of Rome was the point that the accusations of transgressing the harsh laws of Hellforth were not heard, as well as the charge of misdemeanor against those who had not given up their copies of the Talmud. The Italian Jews also made an effort to obtain from the Pope the remission of the interdict against the Talmud. But this question was in 589 the hands of the Cardinals and the Bishops sitting in the Council of Trent, and to carry out their object the Italian communities chose two deputies October, 1563. As the Council only approved the list of forbidden books previously made out to the papal office, the opinion of the Pope and those who surrounded him served as a guide in the treatment of Jewish writings. The decision of this point was left to the Pope, who afterwards issued a bull to the effect that the Talmud was indeed a person like all humanistic literature, including Ruthman's Argent's Bible and Kabbalistic writings, but that it would be allowed to appear if the name Talmud were omitted, and if before its publication the passages and inimical to Christianity were excised, that is to say, if it were submitted to censorship March 24, 1564. Strange, indeed, that the Pope should have allowed the thing, and forbidden its name. He was afraid of public opinion, which would have considered the contradiction too great between one Pope, who had sought out and learned the Talmud, and the next, who was allowing it to go untouched. At all events, there was now a prospect that this written memorial, so indispensable to all Jews, would once more be permitted to see the light, although in a main condition. The printing of the Talmud was in fact undertaken a few years later at Basel. But even this slight concession was withdrawn from the Jews of the papal states when Pius IV was succeeded by a Pope who held moody, monkish, intolerant institutions in higher esteem than human happiness and human life, and who carried the ecclesiastical aims of Carol and his colleagues to their extreme consequence. Pius V 1566-1572 outdid his pattern, all four, in love of persecution and cruelty. This Pope hated Jews no less than he hated Swiss Calvinists and French Huguenots. They soon felt the severity of the new ecclesiasticism 593 months after the throne in April 19, 1566. Pius V confirmed in every respect the restrictions which Paul IV had imposed on Jews. He even increased their severity and disregarded the ameliorations of his predecessor as if they had never been granted. The former regulations, then, were enforced, excluded from intercourse with Christians, prohibition to own lands, or to carry on any business except the trade in wool clothes, compulsion to wear the distinctive Jew badge, and a refusal to commit more than one synagogue. But these edicts were not issued against the Jews in the papal states only. They extended throughout the whole Catholic world. For at that day, in a period of spiteful reaction against Protestantism, the decrees of the Pope made a far different impression from what they had produced previously, and found willing settlers. Thus days of sorrow were again beginning for the Jews of Catholic countries. Once more Joseph Cohen had to enter trials in the of persecution, once more to collect the tears of his people in his veil of reading their crop badger. The ecclesiastical tyrant, Pius V, often gave the opportunity. Under the pretext that the Jews of the papal states had infringed his canonical laws, he caused a number of them to be thrown into prison, and their books to be collected and burnt. The prosperous community of Bologna was visited with a special severity, the blow being aimed at their property. In order to have a legal reason for robbery, confusing questions upon Christianity were put at the formal hearing before the tribunal of the Inquisition. For example, whether the Jews regarded Catholics as idolaters, whether the forms of implication against them in Ennis, and the kingdom of sin and prayers referred to Christians and the papacy, and especially whether the story, in a work of little read, about a master, the son of an outcast, was intended to refer to Jesus. 591A baptized Jew, named Alexander, had drawn up the points of accusation, and the prisoners were questioned upon them, under application of torture. Some of them succumbed to the pain, and confessed everything that the bloody tribunal asked them. Only the rabbi of Bologna, Ishmael Shemina, had the courage to carry him under torture, that if he should confess anything during the unconsciousness which might ensue from his sufferings, such confession would be null and void. As others, however, had confessed to slanders uttered by Jews against Christians, the papal curia had an excuse for its robberies. The rich and the upper classes were forbidden under the severest penalties to leave the town. But this foolish prohibition awakened in the minds of the Jews of Bologna the idea of leaving the place entirely and forever. By guarding the gatekeeper, they succeeded in escaping, with their wives and children, from the net spread for them, and fled to Ferrara. Pope Pius V was so incensed against the Jews for this act that he informed the College of Cardinals that all Jews were to be expelled from the papal states. In vain, some of the church dignitaries protested, showing how the Jews had been protected by the chair of St. Peter from time immemorial, that it had indeed pledged itself to shield the remainder of the Jews, in the hope that they might be saved. In vain did the commercial world of Ancona entreat the Pope not to ruin by his own deep the commercial prosperity of the papal states. His hatred of Jews cycled the voice of common sense, of justice, and of interest. The bull was issued February 26, 1569, that all Jews in the papal states, except those of Rome and Ancona, should depart within three months. Those who remained were to be reduced to slavery, and undergo even severer punishment. There were at that time about 1,000 Jewish families, 592 and 72 synagogues in the papal states, excluding Rome, Ancona, and Bologna. In spite of the misery which threatened them, almost all included in this decree decided upon immigration, and only very few became Christians. The exiles also suffered loss of property, because they had not time to sell their estates, and collect the debts owing to them. The historian Cadelia and Yaki alone lost over 10,000 ducats by his debtors in Ravenna. The exiles dispersed, and sought protection in the neighboring little states of Pesaro, Urbino, Ferrara, Mantua, and Milan. The Jews of Ignat and Venetian, the only communities remaining on French territory since the expulsion of the Jews from France 200 years previously, were also ordered to leave. The reactionary princes of the church had long cast malicious glances upon them, for they had been particularly favored by the officials of the papal states under the humanistic popes, Leo X, Lemon VII, and especially Paul III. The three received its only income from this district through their commerce. The Jews of Ignat, Carpentras, and other towns, owned great wealth and property of all kinds, and held lands. 
Most of the Jews of the Italian and French ecclesiastical territories, like all itself from Christian countries, went to Turkey, and there met with the kindest reception, if they were able to get so far without being attacked and maltreated by the robber knights of the Order of Malta. It seemed almost as if there were to be an end of Jews in Christian Europe. Hatred, persecution, and banishment reigned everywhere. In Catholic dominions, the fanaticism of the papacy prevailed, and in Protestant countries, the narrowness of Lutheranism, sunk from a former height to the level of a child's quarrel. Both seemed to desire the enforcement of the oft expressed thought of arch enemies of the Jews, that Jews have no right to dwell in the West. 593. Chapter SDII. The Jews in Turkey. Don Joseph Nassi. Joseph Nassi's favor with Sultan Solomon is friendship with Prince Selim hostility of Venice and France to Nassios. Nassi restores Tiberius, and his created Duke of Nassis, he Vizier Mohammed so called he Turks. At the instigation of Nassi, on the side of the Stalin of Gastro, second in the Netherlands, the Ashkenazi election of Henry of Andrew as King of Poland, Shkenazi negotiates a peace between Venice and Turkey, Italia, and Yakia, and Jewish literature in Turkey, Osip Karo compiles the Shelfing of Tsar of Dalvasi, Sakhar, and he Jewish thought, age, bread of the Catalog, and his disciple, Jane Vita Kala Brady. Of Joseph Nassi, so here, and the influence of Jewish women in Turkey. 1566 to 1600 CE. Again, as often before, the friends in the web of universal history were so involved that it was impossible to annihilate the Jews of Christendom even by systematic persecution. The sun, obscured on the Jewish horizon by gloomy clouds in the west, again rose bright in the east. Through a favorable turn of affairs, a time was beginning in Turkey which, to this official observer, may seem a brilliant epic. The words of the state, the of the countries of the cross, occupied a very influential position in the land of the present, rose to the rank of Duke, and ruled over many Christians. All the Jews in Turkey, amounting to millions in number, rose to then find it to a free and honorable station, the end of their despising left numerous brethren in Christian Europe. With rage, the Jew and Christian potentates saw their plans here and there frustrated by Jewish hands, and their internal complications rendered more and more involved and tangled. The downtrodden man had defied 94 and had to its tormentors. Joseph Massey, or Joe Meese, the outlaw Morano of Portugal, caused anxious hours to many a Christian ruler and diplomatist, who were obliged to flatter him in an abject manner, though they would have something dead like a dog if he had given their power. The illustrious Republic of Venice, the mighty Kingdom of Spain, the conceited government of Venice, the Kingdom of Papacy, all saw themselves in name of him. Joe Meese, or Don Joseph Massey, who had been well recommended to the Turkish court by French statesmen when first he entered Turkey, and he caught yet more popular by his agreeable presence, his inventive genius, his experience, and his knowledge of Christian and Jewish culture. Sultan Solomon, who went to the Menbrot, soon took him into favor. He formed extensive plans for beginning a war with Spain and aiding the Mahanim on the Duke of the E.C., Lord of Andro. 
Joseph did not reside in the capital of this duchy, where he had been chased by a 97 far away from the center of affairs, but remained in his handsome house of Elvira near Constantinople, and accused the government of the islands to a Spanish nobleman, a Christian named Cornillo, whose father had been governor of Sedonia. Jealously as the Christian princes regarded this Jewish duke, placed upon an equality with them, European affairs were in such a condition that they were forced not only to recognize, but even to flatter him. If they wished to gain anything at the Turkish court, they dared not ignore him, knowing how high he stood in Stalin's favor, and of how much weight his opinion was in the divan. When an Austrian embassy from Emperor Ferdinand I arrived in Constantinople after fresh victories gained by the Turks in Hungary to sue for peace, and when the great dignitaries by gifts and annual subsidies, it was charged to the Turks with Joseph of Nazis. The British Germans were obliged to dissemble their hatred. The two states which set themselves most to oppose him, namely France and Venice, felt the power of the Jewish Duke severely. The King of France declined to pay the debt contract with the Moroccan house of and transferred to Joseph. The latter easily procured a permit from the Sultan, by virtue of which he was allowed to seize all ships nearing the French baggage and any Turkish harbor. Joseph of Nazis sent privateers as far as Algiers to make a raid upon French merchant vessels. At last, he succeeded in getting possession of several vessels in the port of Alexandria, captured all the merchandise on board, and sold it to pay the debt owing to him in 1569. The court of France raised a clamor, protested, and so on, but all in vain. Selling the tentative statement. A coolness arose in consequence in the diplomatic relations of the two countries, which was more injurious to France than to Turkey. The French ambassador of the French Republic, therefore, 598 very desires to bring about the authority of Joseph and Nazis. Trying to suppress the constancy and to weak act the earnings of the wisdom of the Catholic Church. 
searched on heavy tones of human beings. The world was a simple cross. In this extremity, the rebels turned to Joseph of Nassus, who had demons of the world, and was in his presence there. Prince William of Orange, the moving spirit of the rebellion, sent a private messenger to Joseph of Nassus, entreating him to persuade the Sultan to declare war against Spain, which would necessitate the withdrawal of the Spanish troops. Jimmy John Gaw? The Austrian Emperor, Bertrand, also promised him to declare war Service from the court also addressed him, gave him the title of Serene Highness, and, what was of greater importance, promised favorable conditions to the Jews in this country to ensure Joseph's approval of his plans. We may almost say that the man, or Turkish Council of State, under Sultan Salim, consisted of two parties trying to checkmate each other the Christian party, represented by the first vizier, and the Jewish, headed by Joseph of Nassus. Through and beside him, there were other Jews who, though only in subordinate positions, exercised input even on the holders of office, and women on the ladies of the harem. Sultan Salim's goodwill towards Jews was so evident that the story became current that by birth he was a Jew, who was into the harem as a prince. Was forced to employ Jewish negotiator and to trust him with important commissions. The Pishanka, ordered to work secretly against the Jews at the Turkish court, was also the first of the United States. So, the only thing about the Pishanka, 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 Displayed six three greatest intelligence and skill in the niceties of diplomatic technicalities, the disentanglement of naughty questions in negotiations, settlements, and compromises. For these qualities, he has been esteemed by successive Venetian agents in Constantinople. The first minister of the Turkish court recognized his diplomatic skill, attached him to his service, and trusted him to the end of his life with such commissions as required tact, wisdom, and discernment in good fulfillment. Whilst the Turkish arms were raised against the Venetians, Solomon Ashkenazi was beginning to lead the work for the future treaty of peace. Christian cabinets did not suspect that the course of events which compelled them to side with one party or the other was sent in motion by Jewish hands. This was especially the case at the election of the Polish king. Turkey. 
when once he was acknowledged, the dignitaries of the Republic, the Doge, and the Senators paid him the greatest honor and attention, because 606 the Turkish court was very sensitive on this point, and would have regarded want of due respect to its representative as an insult. Solomon was, therefore, received in state audience at the Doge's palace, and there the act of peace between Turkey and Venice was signed by him on behalf of the former. The Signoria showed him the most polite attentions during his stay in Venice May to July, 1574, and all the European ambassadors in Venice paid him for it. Solomon was an angel of deliverance to his fellow believers in Venice. Their joy at the honor shown by the authorities to one of their race was mingled with anxiety and sorrow on account of threatened expulsion. The Doge Mosini had insisted upon the fulfillment of the decree of banishment previously issued against the Jews. Many Jewish families had already departed without waiting for the term to expire. Solomon had arranged with Jacopo Saranzo, the Venetian agent in Constantinople, to receive these unfortunates. On his return to Venice, Saranzo at once brought the question of the Jews to the consideration of the Council of the Doge and the Ten.
Even so, Athena called the breath well, my god, who died, and was, therefore, beloved by kings and peoples, lies far from the land of Ur, beneath the dust of Macedonia. The exaltation of the Turkish Jews and their contentment with their present condition imbued them with thoughts of independence. Whilst the Jews of Christendom had no such thought, and from time immemorial considered themselves in a condition of subjugation to their masters, the Turkish Jews became familiar with the idea of regarding themselves as independent men. Joseph of Naxos long cherished the thought of founding a Jewish state. The Jew and the statesman in him yearned for this, and the enormous wealth of his mother in law, over which he had control, was to serve him as the means for its execution. Even when a fugitive Morano had seriously put before the Republic of Venice the request that it give him one of its numerous islands, so that he might people it with Jewish inhabitants. But this was refused either on account of the narrow mindedness of the Christian or the fear of mercantile competition. When later on Joseph stood high in favor with Prince Solomon, and also with Sultan Solomon, he obtained from them, besides seven villages, the ruins of the city of Tiberias, for a small Jewish state to be peopled only with Jews. He sent one of his agents to superintend the rebuilding of 611 Tiberias. The Turkish prince gave the Pasha of Egypt strict orders to assist the building in every way. The island occupants of the neighboring villages were compelled to rent the forced labor, and the new and beautiful houses and streets of the city of Tiberias were completed in a year. Joseph of Naxos wished to make it a manufacturing town to compete with Venice. He planted mulberry trees for the cultivation of silkworms, and introduced looms for the manufacture of silks. He also imported gold from Spain for the making of fine cloth. Joseph does not seem to have directed his full energy to the little Jewish state. His plans were far more extensive, and thus New Tiberias never became an important place. He next endeavored to obtain the island of Naxos as a dukedom, together with the adjacent islands of the E.C., and when he was fortunate enough to be appointed duke by Sultan Selim, he thought no more about peopling his little island state with Jews. Perhaps it was not practicable, his mind was next set on becoming king of Cyprus. It is possible that he might have transformed this island of the goddess of beauty into a Jewish state had he obtained possession of it, but his enemy, the Grand Vizier, Mohammed Sokoli, prevented this. Thus his dreams of founding an independent Jewish state were dispelled. In reality, Joseph of Naxos did nothing of lasting importance for Judaism. He made various attempts, and then relaxed in his endeavors, or misspent his means. The fact that Jews occupied an exceedingly favored position in Turkey for so long a period did not result in correspondingly enduring progress. They did not produce a single great genius who originated ideas to stimulate future ages, nor mark out a new line of thought for men of average intelligence. Not one of the leaders of the different congregations was above the level of mediocrity 612 the rabbis and preachers were deeply learned in their particular subjects, but kept to the beaten track, without making a new discovery or completing an original contribution, even in their own department. Only one rabbi left to posterity and never his work, which even yet possessed significance, disputed the rabbi. But even this work contained nothing more original. Joseph Carl, chief rabbi of the city of Safed, in Palestine, completed, after many years of toil, a new book of religious ordinances, the Shelf Nara. Religious impulses, mystical fanaticism, and ambition, had equal shares in the making of this book. For Joseph Carl was still subject to strange visions, he still believed that he would be recognized everywhere as the highest authority by the compilation of his religious code, and known for Jewish religious life. And that, by this means, he would accomplish the revival of the rabbinical ordination, in which Jacob Yehud had failed. Resort, in fact, the unity of Judaism, and thereby hasten the coming of the Messiah. He spent the whole of his life in collecting the vast material, in weighing pros and cons of arguments, drawing conclusions and arranging them in their proper places. By doing this, he supplied a serious want. There was no manual that embraced the whole field of religious observance. As the Talmud and the later religious codes, to an even greater extent, favored differences of opinion upon nearly every single point in matters of religion, ritual, law, and the marriage state. Disputes constantly occurred, which led to altercation and divisions in the communities, for it rarely happened that two rabbis agreed upon any question that came up for discussion. Each was able to deduce reasons for or against any argument from the vast mass of rabbinical literature. It was this confusion and divergence of opinion that Joseph Carl wished to check by means of the 630 new religious code. He embraced the whole of the vast field of Talmudic and political literature, although his intellect could not. Julius, are you still there? <laughs> What's up?
Well, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of moody today. I, I don't I don't know what it is. I, I I thought I got enough sleep and everything like that, but it's annoying when the well I, I don't know the bots are taking you out. How about you? Oh, and you know <laughs> that that's uh, and I've done I've done that before. I don't know. I just have uh, shall we say a proclivity for a heavy machine gun, and um, it's probably just my imagination. But but I don't I don't know. It's it's like. Um, I guess right now, well, I got on Reddit and I saw, you know, the list of like 430 something bots, right? And um, I really didn't realize that there was really, you know, I thought there were more uh, live players. Um, and now I'm going through a thing. I mean, you know, I played all games um, from arcades and stuff. And I mean, when you play Space Invaders, yeah, I mean, you know the Space Invaders are not being played by real players, you know? And you sort of, from the beginning, you're analyzing their their behavior based on an idea that they're going to consistently behave in a certain way. Um, but facing bots in Mech Arena, it's like sometimes a bot will come out and it'll have a missile rack that will do a hundred thousand damage and you don't know if that's random or so I'm kind of I'm kind of going through a, a thing of wishing um, I had some kind of an idea of um, is there a method to the madness you know can I um, but I, I think it's affected my playing the last couple of days. I haven't been, uh, I feel I haven't been playing as well after I saw that list. Um, right, right. That's what I do um, in the, there's certain uh, uh, death matches where there's like a ramp and I get behind the ramp and unless unless they come from two sides at once and get down there behind the rent, they have very little chance. Um, so I would consistently uh, win in that. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, Hopefully, you know, this is kind of, it's kind of new for me. My, uh, my daughter got into gaming. I, I, I actually, um, was a game developer. I taught, uh, the create, like how to build first person shooters at college level with, a, a game engine called Dassault Virtuals, which is very old. It's been discontinued. I was kind of like leaving game development uh, at the university where I worked uh, when Unity came out. So I did a little bit of curriculum development for um, uh, for Unity. But then I was trying to get away from it and do some different kind of work. But then I had a daughter and my daughter, I was working in a, a school and my daughter was not getting a lot of attention at home and she really got into gaming by watching YouTube Kids. So I'm trying to uh, get into it too, and um, she's four. She's four. She uh, yesterday she wanted to paint right, and I for the first time I have this little work area uh, way back in the back of the the house. You know, you go down this corridor, you know, and way at the end of it there's one workstation. And uh, I have a black light back there. So for the for the first time, 
I was like, she wanted to paint, and I was searching for the watercolors, and I couldn't find them. And I realized I had these these day glow, day glow, um, you know, black light crayons, right? So I, I I said, come back here, you know, I've got a surprise. And I turn on the black light, and she's like, it's radioactivity. It's radioactive. I was like, <laughs> you know. And my wife is like, she should be on her workbook doing the D-O-G and the C-O-T. And I'm like, she's like spelling thermal lance. You know, she's on chat spelling thermal lance. Bazooka, right? She was like, I had to bazooka my friend because he was evil. I said, well, there's good evil and bad evil. <laughs> she was like, he was bad. I was like, okay, well, then you bazooka him. B-A-Z-O-O-K-A. But radioactive, that was, you know, she saw the day glow crayons and she's like, they're radioactive. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm, I'm in an approval mode on the games as far as accelerating learning, but parents, I think, should really be there. Yeah, yeah, I think parents should be in there, you know. There's some messed up stuff going on. Uh, you know, some kids are up in there and uh, getting messed up in the head, and, and you kind of need to be there. I, you know, the thing I'm working with her now is teaching her how to lose uh, well, <laughs> you know, not get so upset. She gets mad at me. She wants me to win. If uh, she gets up in my lap, you know, she wants, uh, she expects me now to win, and she, she'll get mad if I don't. But when she's sitting in my lap, it's hard for me to play well. So I'm working through things. I'm in a weird, uh, a weird mood. I, I, you know, I really, um, and I guess you kind of tend to project um, human traits on a bot you know you'll make observations and but it could be the bot is just doing something random that it's programmed to do you want you you wonder about um it's like in the in the ancient times of early video games you know like i would watch a friend of mine i didn't play it but he was addicted to everquest and he he figured out the behavior of of basic kind of bot elements in the game and he would do what needed to be done to build up his his coin or his experience level by comprehending the bots right so um and i i think you could do that but now we're facing a much more complicated kind of bot <laughs> and teams of bots you know that I, I guess that's uh, that's disheartening too. Like when you're like, uh, hey, can I get some heels? I saw somebody was mad. Uh, we should have a class action. I spent a lot of money. We have to have a class action lawsuit. Uh, well, no. Uh, I mean, generally, you can see if they're in a clan, they're not a bot. Um. And, you know, I, I wonder, okay, here, here's something um, that I was doing on my stream to kind of make it funny. You know, if there's a female when you're in elementary school or whatever, and she's mad at you, this was a thing when I was little, the teacher would say, oh, she likes you, right? That's why she's, she's mad at you, right? So... I would kind of make a, a, a running joke commentary about female mechs that were uh, attacking or, or trying to get revenge or something. Oh, she must like me or something like a running gag. Well, um, Galway gal, uh, my my paternal grandmother, uh, is, her family is from the Aran Islands, which is off the coast of, of Galway. They came to the United States before Georgia was... Uh, Georgia before the United States, you know, that, but we know for sure. And a DNA evidence now shows that, yeah, they were off the coast of, of Galway. So 
Galway gal, I had a joke, you know, maybe we're distant cousins or something, and I would, like, try to talk to her. And I went on the chat, and I tried to say, where is Galway gal? Nobody ever answered or whatever like that. Well, then I saw that on a list of bots. Now, but one time, I was playing a death match, and it's on my stream somewhere. You can see it. I went back and looked at it. It was like, um, I had, what, what is it? The first time you kill somebody, it's humiliate. You kill them twice, it's humiliation. Three times, it's smackdown. Four times, you kill somebody, it's nemesis, right? So I I was like nemesis on her. I, I, I killed her four times. And I looked, I said, here she comes. And she like ran the gauntlet trying to get to me, right? But when she got to me and she was at the top of the ramp, I said, you know, my, my weapons just and loaded and dropped. And I just hit my shield and I was in an Ares, you know? And I was like, I don't feel like shooting you anymore because I, you know, I did all the way to Nemesis. You know, I just, we're in this death match, free for all or whatever. And when you do that, when you do something like that, like run across all these people to get to me, um, I don't feel like shooting you because I feel like you're getting mad, you know, and I, I don't want you to be in a bad place in your mind, right? So I didn't shoot her. I, I just like dropped my guns, right? And she didn't shoot me. And she stood there and I looked at her and she looked at me and I mean all the battle was going on raging around us right and um, she wouldn't fire and I was like I'm not going to fire and then two robots jumped on both sides of her from both sides and blam blew her away smithereens and that kind of a behavior I don't know I, I sort of look for some kind of sense of humanity you know behind the the controls or whatever some kind of behavior that indicates and this this happens sometimes in a match when a, a lower division person joins me like a kid or something like that that they'll sidle up beside me or something like that they'll they'll, they'll do some kind of behavior that gives me an indication that there there's a real person at the controls but so i had this thing happen and it uh there were a couple of moments with this Galway gal. I had this running gag. She must like me because she's chasing after me, right? Macarena, where the girls come after you. That's what I would say. And um, but she, um, yeah, she came up on a list of bots. Now, if you search on Reddit, um, there's a the gamers have have tried to create a a, a comprehensive list of the of the bots. And it's pretty big. It's like 432 uh, or something like that. It's, it's, it's a big list of bots. But I'm not entirely convinced that the company can't put a real player on a bot from time to time. Right? Because the company would be, would be able to do that. The owner would of the game would be able to do that. But it, it's like I'm in a weird place because I'm like, okay... Yeah, I would play Tail Gunner and Battlezone and and uh, uh, Galaga, and you know every enemy is a bot. You know that, but there's this idea of like you will learn exactly their behavior and then you can master the game. It's like Super Mario. You're playing Super Mario. You know uh, that there's a mastery point, but what is what is messing with my mind uh what is messing with my mind is um you know like i, I was just in a, a a match and here comes a, a bot from the list and he's he's got a missile rack that does it's totally anything i put down it will nuclearize and vaporize me beyond all redemption because his, his, his weapons are like uh, doing 100,000 of damage in a, a missile rack. I, I guess. So I, I'm, I've been playing now. If you, if you get on, I'm the real Mystic Mask on YouTube. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> and can you, uh, is your name the same? Can we add each other as friends? 
I intend, you know, I intend to keep playing the game, but like I said, the past couple of days I've been going through some changes because I'm like, uh, um, okay, if they are bots, can I, okay, let me see, sudden SVK, let me search for you, okay, uh, oh, can you send me your number, oh, yeah, yeah, let's see. Let me get my number. There, my number will go on the screen. Uh, and I, I'll put it down here so you can get it. Uh, I mean, I, I like the game. I've had a lot of fun. My daughter's name is Freya, so she took an interest in uh, the community manager, Freya. You know, guys, oh, hey, look, Freya, she's got the same name as you. Right. Okay. Um, Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going through this thing. Well, if they're bots, how to, you know, like when you're playing a, an old arcade game like Galaga or Temp, even something like Tempest, the bots, and I don't know if you remember Tempest because it's really, really old. Uh, and I think Tempest can be played still. It's an arcade game. It can be played on an emulator. But it's like these... Um, the bots in it are the alien enemies that drop down into these channels. And if you're in a channel and they drop on you, the, the damage hits you. And they're like, it just gets harder and harder and harder. But I mean, we're going through this time in the culture now where, you know, they're, they're talking about People are worried about uh, artificial intelligence uh, things, like some of the big computing agencies that are that are uh, creating, um, you know, autonomous thinking computers or whatever. Like, we need to study this more before we, you know, give these creatures that we're creating too much power. Perhaps we're creating some horrible frankincense monster. That's Mel Blank would say. A horrible frankincense monster. Um. So I'm, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like, I think I'm gonna get over uh, the feeling. I, di I didn't realize that, you know, you know, I realized that there were bots. Of course, there, there's, there's some bots. But I didn't realize it was 400 plus of them. Okay, okay, let me let me check my thing. Invites, invitations, sudden SVK. Czech Republic, are you?
Man, that's that's interesting. I uh... oh, here here comes my daughter. Hold on. Oh, come here. She, she just woke up and cranky. Uh, come, come here, sweetie. I'm talking to my friend. Come on, you you want something? I'm here, honey. Come on and get on the juggernaut. You want to ride it? No? Okay. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, man, I, I got a lot of uh, my uh, my sister's husband uh, was uh, uh, from from Poland, and uh, it turns out after I had my DNA check that I've got uh, um, South Slavic DNA and Roma uh, DNA. I didn't really realize that I had yeah, my my DNA is primarily what's characterized as European Irish. But it's strongly Jewish, uh, Northern European Jewish, and uh, uh, Hispanic uh, uh, Jewish. Um, but uh, I don't know if you can understand. Bosans, Bosanski, Bosanski phrase u uvoj knizi su tematski krupisani i odabrani zbog svoje nepostrednosti, kratkoće i važnosti za potrebe novu prestigli stanovnika sjednjene my tongue, you know, the muscle for for Slavic languages or whatever my tongue is, I don't I don't speak it enough. But I used to <clears throat> um, work with uh, uh, refugees. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's like it's Posanski, Posanski frase. It, it's like uh, uh, it, it's like Serbian, but without the like you know you say net instead of instead of net, right? So yeah, it's 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 pretty. I found that I really pick up um, certain languages very very fast. I I I. Uh, uh, I speak Italian, non si passi di cibo mortale, chi si passi di cibo celeste. Um, uh, and a German, der nada heil ist im Busse berschieden. Ergent, I'm sorry. Einstein in der seligen Frieden, vor hell und tot. Yeah, and uh, I speak, um, but I speak fluent Chinese, and uh, I've got about a year of, of Japanese uh, university level. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we added each other as, as, as friends, man. I really am, because, uh, uh, and I hope we get to play together. But I need to, I need to drop off uh, uh, and uh, uh, see to my daughter. Um, but yeah, the Slavoj Žižek, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good to meet you, Julius. I uh, uh, hope we will be good friends. Uh, it's nice to meet real people and not just bots. So I will see you. I'm going to try to, I'm going to end the stream now and I'm going to try to get back on after I see to my daughter.